From the New York Times, this is The New Washington. I'm Michael Barbaro. Today, Roger Stone. He knows who killed John Kennedy. He's well aware that Lyndon Johnson killed John Kennedy. People like gossip. They like the salacious. Roger Stone has been Donald Trump's chief political advisor. He planned and ran his presidential campaign, and he's been his hatchet man. He spent 40 years as a hatchet man. Trying to stop Trump is like stepping in front of a hurtling freight train. I value my relationship with the president and his family. Try to impeach him. Just try it. You will have a spasm of violence in this country, an insurrection like you've never seen. Actually had a leftover egg roll and fried rice for breakfast. Oh, sounds good. It was pretty Naturally. good, actually. Naturally. Roger Stone. Hey, how you doing? How are you? I'm good. How about you? What are you doing in L.A.? Uh, I'm out here trying to make sure that the incredible Netflix documentary, Get Me Roger Stone, gets uh, an Academy Award. Ah, you're promoting. It's It's only the greatest political documentary in the history of the world. So, yes. Michael Barbaro, who did you talk to this week? Maggie Haberman, I spoke with Roger Stone, longtime advisor, confidant, and fellow provocateur of President Trump's. He is a fascinating figure. He is a uh, native of Connecticut. He was very involved with college Republicans, which I think is where he met uh, his lifelong friend uh, at this point, Paul Manafort. Stone went on to become a Richard Nixon acolyte. It was not high level. He at some point got a tattoo of Richard Nixon's face on his back, which anybody who wants to Google can find. On his back. Um, on his back, right between the shoulder blades. Um, Stone led Ronald Reagan's election campaign in New York. That is where he met Donald Trump. We just got along extremely well. And after Reagan's election, and I elected not to join the administration, um, he was among the first clients of my new lobbying firm. And we worked on a myriad of fairly boring but important issues for him. Like what? Um, currency transaction rules regarding casinos. He was building a skyscraper that was five feet taller than the, than the federal limit for mm-hmm. which he needed a waiver. Things like that. And you said you, you liked him from the first meeting. What was it that you liked about him and what, what kind of what was the he's, spark he, there? he's a regular guy you can talk to him like a regular person there's nothing formal or stilted about him uh and he's he's funny he's got a great self-deprecating wit he's just fun to be with uh and um we hit it off immediately it was not until 1987 really late 87 that I began thinking about him as a presidential candidate. So Maggie, I want to talk about why it is that I talked to Roger Stone. Because a lot of people regard him as dangerously outside the mainstream. And to my mind, it's because he helped elect a man to the presidency. And he still advises that president. And it feels to me, and I wonder if you think this is right, that the brand of politics that Roger Stone has represented for decades, this kind of outside, provocative, fringe approach, it appears to have leapt from the fringes to the White House itself now, right? It's, I think it's more than just that Stone is seen as um, being so far out of the mainstream. I think it's that he is seen as saying things that are unacceptable. He is seen as saying things that are um, appear to be endorsing violence. Try to impeach him. Just try it. You will have a spasm of violence in this country, an insurrection like you've never seen. You think? He has made racially incendiary comments. Well, I would have to admit that um, calling Roland Martin a fat Negro, that was a two martini tweet. And I regret that. I really do. He I has really helped promote conspiracy theories, something that he and the president also share mm-hmm. um, as a common trait. The truth is, Jimmy Carter's middle name was not Hussein. A very substantial number of people wonder, because of the policies of this administration, about whether the president is a Muslim. They may this wonder, is not but you know. All of those reasons are why Stone is seen as controversial. But why is he seen now as important? Well, because he's the person who knows the president 
the longest in a political context, and frankly, I would argue the best out of really almost anyone outside of the president's family who speaks to him. Mm. Uh, and they have had a, a what I would describe as a strange relationship that's been almost um, fraternal in a lot of ways. Mm. Um, he understands Trump really, I think, better than than almost anyone. Yeah, I think we have a complicated relationship. But first of all, recognize I, I'm a Trump loyalist. Even when he's wrong, I'll be there. Roger Stone spent a lot of time uh, promoting a potential Donald Trump presidential run, both in 2000. In 2000, I wanted him to seek the Reform Party nomination for president. I think he took a hard look at it, but he correctly determined that you can't get elected president of the United States in America unless you are either a Republican or a Democrat. And 2011 was when... We both recognized that Mitt Romney was a stone-cold loser, uh, that he was not capable of beating Obama. Uh, and I think it was really the first time that Donald ever really seriously considered running for president. He came pretty close to making that race. And when you say stone-cold loser, I mean, that's a that's a, that's a pretty unkind thing to say, but what do you, what have do you, you mean met, by have that? Have you met Mitt Romney? I mean, I covered him, yeah. Does he come across to you as genuine and real? Or does he come across to you as a total phony? It's what, what I'm gathering is that you felt, you've found something authentic about Trump. Yeah, what's authentic is that he's not a creation of someone else. There's no Karl Rove in Trump world. No one tells Donald Trump what to say or what to think or where to go. Yeah, he's he's open to advice. He'll listen as long as you want. But at the end of the day, he's his own man. He's not a confection. I think that quality, that that genuine, authentic quality, even when he makes mistakes, people find it refreshing because they don't mm. think he's a packaged confection based on, you know, polling and focus groups and so on. He is very much his own man. So let me talk to you about the the 2016 campaign. How did you become involved as an advisor and kind of what was your role? Well, I had uh, I had been a paid advisor to the president's 2012 exploratory effort. And when he decided to run seriously in 2016, uh, I was recruited by him as a consultant. Pull this up. It says, Mr. Trump fired Roger Stone last night. We have a tremendously successful campaign, and Roger wanted to use the campaign for his own political, for his own personal publicity. He has had a number of articles about him recently, and Mr. Trump wants to keep the focus of the campaign on how to make America great again. Were you fired by Donald Trump? No, not at all. Uh, and uh, let me say from the top that I have nothing but admiration and respect for Donald Trump. I resigned in August only because it became abundantly clear that Donald Trump is his own strategist. He does not mm. need a strategist. He was determined to do it his way. I frankly had reservations about the potential success of doing it his way. Mm -hmm. I didn't think that you could counteract hundreds of millions of dollars of paid negative advertising with access to the free media. I was wrong about that. <laughs> I did not foresee that his set piece rallies would become wall to wall yes, Aaron, broadcast right now I show you media this. events. We turn the camera around, panning around to the back of the arena. There is pushing and shoving going on inside this arena. People are throwing objects. CNN are now and Fox giving him literally hundreds of millions of dollars of coverage right that he would otherwise now. have to pay for. And now you're hearing Donald yeah. Trump people on the other side of the arena yelling Trump, Trump, Trump. Uh, the security does not have a handle on the situation here. It is total chaos. If they ran a one hour program of Marco Rubio, the value of their commercials would drop through the floor because nobody would watch because he had nothing interesting or provocative to say. So we're back to this. We're back to the word provocative. In this case, that worked. And you yourself, somebody who thinks of himself as a provocateur, I guess, underestimated it. To some well, point. I just didn't think that the media would play ball. Now, in retrospect, mm. I realize 
Bill and Hillary Clinton wanted to run against Donald Trump. They thought there was no way they could lose. I argue that she would have defeated any other Republican other than Donald Trump. He was the only Republican who could beat her. Maggie, you say that Donald Trump and Roger Stone are friends and that they have this fraternal relationship. But how much weight does Roger Stone's opinion actually carry with Trump? And how much access does he actually have to the president? So he's never direct on that. He will always never directly answer the question when I have asked it of when they speak. And I don't think I've ever seen him answer it. He's, I think he always says from time to time or something like that. Mm-hmm. Roger, how often do you speak with the president these days? Uh, it has been my policy since he was nominated, not to comment on the frequency, content, or (laughs) scope of our conversations. Got it. I think that Stone is both inside and outside, and I don't know of another way to describe it. I mean, he he does talk to the president, um, but he also is constantly playing an outside influence game. He understands, you know, what the president responds to, and you see him sort of raise the noise level pretty high in certain segments of, um, you know, alternative media. Uh, I wouldn't say conservative media. It's it's because it's not mainstream conservative. What's coming up? What's coming up in the next hour, my friend? No, you're exactly right, Alex. This is the new McCarthyism. If you're not for nuclear war with the Russians over Syria, well, then you must be a traitor to your the country of your birth. It, it's outrageous. But you uh, see him raise the, raise the volume me, pretty Alex, high. Because, and when you say raise um, the volume, do you mean he actually uses a media outlet to communicate with the president or somehow pressure him? Correct, and he would hardly be the only person in the president's world who does that. And so the House of Cards is coming down. They now admit Susan Rice did illegally spy. Other people did it. I mean, as you said a month ago, or more, this is the new Watergate. Well, and uh, the left has said repeatedly, somebody's going to go to jail, somebody's going to go to jail in this whole Russia thing. They're absolutely right. Some people are going to go to jail, but they're the front line of Barack Obama's advisors and retainers Maggie, what do you see as Stone's objective in giving any credence at all to these kinds of conspiracy theories? As I said, many of them completely false. Are they advancing any kind of a platform or his brand or or what? They're certainly advancing Stone's brand. Uh, to some extent, they're advancing the president's brand, but they're advancing a sense of um, disorientation uh, and a sense of instability and I think both of their brands rely on that. If you can never really tell hmm. if 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 all news is fake, then that means ours is too, right? I mean, that's essentially where this is coming from, is to make everything seem the same and make you doubt just a little bit what you hear from everything. various places. Yes. You know, there's a there's a line from uh one of the Batman movies mm-hmm. where Michael Caine playing the the butler, Alfred or Albert or whatever his name is, um, says to says to Bruce Wayne trying to explain why the Joker does what he does. Some men aren't looking for anything logical, like money. They can't be bought, bullied, reasoned, or negotiated with. Some men just want to watch the world burn. Hmm. And I would say, sometimes with Stone, he just wants to watch the world burn. We'll be right back. Delta Airlines wants to make your travel experience easy and enjoyable. With the Fly Delta app, you'll always be connected and informed. The app has real-time bag tracking with RFID, giving you peace of mind in your hand. Download the Fly Delta app now. Support for the new Washington comes from ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring but don't know where to post your job to find the best candidates? With ZipRecruiter, you can post your job to 100-plus job sites with just one click. Their powerful technology efficiently matches the right people to your job, so you get quality candidates fast. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within one day. And right now you can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Washington. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Washington. Roger, how would you assess the presidency so far? It appears from the outside to be a, a kind of a study in frustrations, a lot of a lot of very big plans that were foiled in one way or another. The Muslim ban, the wall, the repeal of the Affordable Care Act. How do you read it? 
I think it's been fairly successful. The number of illegal boarding crossings have dropped almost nothing. So actually, just for the first time, um, enforcing the law as it's written seems to be working. Where where I'm disappointed is I, I do not understand why the president has appointed so many establishment Republicans hmm. to his cabinet and to his staff that just do not agree with his worldview or his agenda. And what are the uh, this, examples of that? Sending 150,000 troops to Syria. Every single one of his advisors was for that. Every member of his cabinet was for it. Every member mm -hmm. of the White House staff was for it. We constantly keep going out and engaging ourselves in endless foreign wars where our inherent national interest is not apparent at all. That's why the actions that he announced in Afghanistan are troubling to me. Hmm. You have a problem he, with he, he, Well, he ran as an anti-interventionist. Uh, if the lesson of history is not clear with both the Brits and the Russians, the Afghanis don't lose home games. There is no way to succeed. So all we're doing is buying time with American dollars and lives. That makes no sense to me. I'm glad now, have what the president... Those disagreements always been areas of contention between Stone and Trump? Or are these just widening now that the president is the president and he has to deal with the day-to-day -day realities of governing? Sure, they're either opening up now or widening. Um, but generally speaking, they're opening up. I mean, certainly on, uh, you know, Mideast engagement. Stone, I think, does not accept that as an answer uh, and has seen Trump's uh, decision on Afghanistan he has seen that as a reflection of the number of generals uh, right. around the president. And I think you've you have heard Stone voice alarm about that for quite some time. Yeah, it looks to me like seven days in May. Uh, too many generals, first of all. Um, I and think seven Madison days in May much. is all about a military coup. Military. And, you know, that's not what Stone was referring to explicitly in that quote. But I have to imagine that he was aware of the double meaning when he said mm -hmm. it. I would imagine that that is part of his concern. Uh, and I I just think the president has, unfortunately, surrounded himself with a number of globalists who don't share his worldview. And you say, when you say globalists, what exactly do you mean? Um, those who think that the sovereignty of the United States is secondarily and that we need to move into some kind of international arrangement in which we just accept the inevitable decline of our country. Maggie, Roger Stone is pretty explicit in our conversation in his fear that the, in the nationalist war against the globalists in this White House, that the globalists are winning. So who are the globalists in this White House and are they winning as Roger Stone fears? Sure. I mean, like the, the word, the term globalist is, um, you know, it's used on Breitbart.com, um, Steve Bannon's website with like big bright globes. Um, right. It, it, in its most negative connotation, I think its critics believe that it's got a, it's got a bit of an anti-Semitic patina. Um, I think other people disagree with that. And it's, you know, the, the targets for the people who are seen as quote unquote globalists by Stone and a lot of Stone's supporters are Gary Cohn, the top economic advisor, mm -hmm. uh, Dina Powell, who is a deputy national security advisor. I mean how do you justify Dina Habib Powell being in the Trump White House? Why do you say her middle name like that? Well, because that's her name. <laughs> but is it meant to suggest something? Is it meant to suggest that she is a globalish Bush Republican who has nothing in common with Donald Trump or his agenda? Um, H.R. McMaster. General McMaster previously worked for a think tank Financed by George Soros. Um, Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law. Uh, I think he's gotten a lot of bad advice from his son-in-law. Ivanka Trump, his daughter. Um, you know, that's that's basically the, the list. I, I'm not sure why he has surrounded himself with establishment figures who don't share his worldview. Hmm. Maggie, how widespread are Stone's concerns about what's going on inside the White House these days? among other nationalists, among other Republicans who thought they were getting something from this president? 
it's it's spreading. I mean, it's not, it would be a mistake to see Stone as some kind of an isolated incident. I don't think that's it. I mean, I think that um, there's, there is a fair amount of disappointment about some of the promises the president has not moved ahead with. I think what we're about to find out is whether um, people who have been positioned as, you know, icons for the base, whether they themselves, like Steve Bannon, have more sway than Trump himself with these voters. Um, but there is disappointment, and it's not just from Stone. So, so Roger, I want to ask you about the president's relationship with with Congress. What do you what do you make of the tensions that have become quite intense over the last week or so between the president and congressional Republicans? I see a golden opportunity. What the president has to run against the Republicans and the Democrats. He has to hmm. run against the elites of both parties. The president's put forward a program for economic prosperity. These career politicians who have run the country into the ground, they're against it. Choose, are you for with me and economic prosperity or are you for the status quo? He should start taking Republicans out in primaries. So Roger Stone laid out a political strategy for the president that is quite provocative and in keeping with the nationalism and the kind of stridency we think of when we think of Steve Bannon. Here's what it is. He says that the president should take direct aim at establishment Republicans who oppose the president's agenda in Congress. Kind of one by one attempt to knock them out of their jobs, whether it's Mitch McConnell or a John McCain, that the president ought to seek to end their careers in Congress. You simply say, Mitch, how many of your caucus do you want me to take out in the next primary and replace them with Trump Republicans who will hmm. vote with me? And then, Mitch, they'll be calling to get rid of you as the leader. Watch Jeff Flake. Watch him lose. He's done. He's history. He's cooked. Is there support for that approach inside the Trump administration, what Stone is suggesting? Uh, less so than there used to be. Um, you know, at one point early on, on the first round of the um, Health care repeal efforts in Congress uh, for that very first effort months ago, I think it was April, um, both Steve Bannon and Mark Short, the legislative director, uh, legislative affairs director, had said, you, we really need to, we need to target one of these people who is threatening the president. And they didn't really end up doing that. They have flirted with hurting Dean Heller. But essentially the way you're seeing the president target people is in this kind of ad hoc way on his Twitter feed. Right. You know, he attacks John McCain because he doesn't like John McCain personally. Um, you know, he attacks Jeff Flake because Jeff Flake attacked him. He attacked Bob Corker because Corker criticized him. These are not carefully honed strategic shots. Well, you have to do what Bill Clinton did. It's triangulation. Run against the Republicans and the Democrats. But how is that supposed to make the president's relationship with Congress? He doesn't need a better, better. relationship. He, he, he needs them to vote for his program because it's more popular than they are. So he, need, he, they, he needs for them to fear the repercussions of voting against. Yes, something right he's now his problem is that no Republican in Washington fears him anymore. But whose fault they is that? They should. They should. Well, uh, look, I think he tried it the other way. He tried to partner with Ryan and McConnell, and it hasn't worked. Roger Stone is saying that Congress needs President Trump more than President Trump needs Congress because of his political stature with Republican voters in the districts of these congressmen. Is Stone right? Well, he's right and he's wrong. Um, Congress needs Trump um, because he still represents the strongest element of the GOP base. Mm -hmm. um, but there, is, there are other segments of the party um, with whom Trump is deeply unpopular. And if uh, Trump's own behavior or if fallout from, you know, Charlottesville or all kinds of other events uh, make it harder for Republicans to hold Congress if they lose a lot of seats in the 2018 midterms, uh, then I think Stone is probably wrong um, because without a GOP Congress, Trump is a lot less powerful. But Roger, if a gamble like that doesn't work out, then isn't the president stuck with a party that controls the Senate and and massively resents him and gets nothing passed that he wants. But they're not getting anything passed now. Hmm. So you're the, saying the, alter no, the, the, the alternative well. to the strategy I outlined, which is Trump and the Republicans have failed. And you have to wear 
their failure. Why should he do that? He's not a he's not an establishment Republican anyway. So Maggie, I want to end on a loyalty question. This is clearly something Trump values almost above all other things in his advisors. Are you loyal to me? When you look at the relationship between Roger Stone and Donald Trump, how do you view Stone's actions as examples of loyalty or betrayals of that loyalty? And and what might that say about his ongoing role in Trump's inner circle as somebody who influences him? Look, I think that one of the things that um, Trump sees as a form of loyalty is durability. And Stone has been around a very, very long time for Trump. A lot of people in Trump's world slide in and out. Stone is, as I said, always there in some form or another. Um, They might be arguing about something. They might be disagreeing. They might be having one of their public spats, which they've had repeatedly. Mm. One of the weird things about loyalty with Trump is he he always kind of wants what he doesn't completely have. Hmm. And you are never more valuable to Donald Trump than when you're walking away from him. So the fact that Stone has this sort of half distance, half in, half out, will always, always, always keep him pretty close. And he knows a lot about Trump. That also um, makes Trump want to keep people close. Roger, the president is is not usually kind to to those who criticize him. Do you worry about criticizing the president at all? How How, how far are you willing to to go in doing that? Or do you have the kind of relationship where you don't feel there are repercussions? Well, uh, repercussions, uh, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, People who know me and have known me long enough know that I tell you what I really think. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's been good for my career. Other times it's not been so good for my career. Uh, If the president becomes a globalist, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to say great things about it. Uh, If the president gets a, a good cut in the corporate tax rate, I'm going to be the first guy out there praising him. He's got the most dynamic pro-growth program of any of the Republican presidential candidates. Now he has to sell it. And he's got to be willing to go to war with the congressional Republicans to do so. Maggie, thank you very much. Michael, thanks for having me. The New Washington is produced by Michael Simon Johnson and Michaela Bouchard. Brad Fisher is our engineer. Lisa Tobin is our executive producer. Samantha Hennig is our editorial director. Our theme music is by Jim Brunberg and Ben Landsberg of Wonderly. Special thanks this week to Luke Vanderplug. That's it for The New Washington. See you back here next week. Listener.